familiar with Denise. We've been fortunate to have her here twice before. The first time for her book, The Girls of Atomic City, which I thought was fabulous. And uh, the most recent one for us was The Last Castle. And anyone who visits the Biltmore Estate in Asheville really needs to, to read that to, uh, to get the history of it. In addition to being an author and a journalist, she's been a producer for various media outlets and served as the head writer for ABC's Who Wants to Be a Millionaire. But the thing that I love is the way she writes nonfiction books, and that's what you're going to see tonight. And for tonight's conversation, we're pleased to have Kate Anderson Brower joining us. Kate is also a journalist who's covered the White House for Bloomberg News. She's worked for CBS News, for Fox. She's contributed to CNN. And she's the author of some fabulous books about Washington, the White House, things like The Residence, Inside the Private World of the White House. First Women, Grace and Power of America's Modern First Ladies, First in Line, Presidents, Vice Presidents in the Pursuit of Power, and Team of Five, the President's Club in the Age of Trump. We're going to start the conversation between Denise and Kate in just a minute, but everybody's going to get a chance to, uh, to take part. All you need to do is put your questions in the Q&A box that's down at the bottom of the screen. I'll be taking a look at those throughout and we'll get to those questions um, in just a, a little bit. So let me just start out with Kate and Denise. And you know, I guess this just goes to show that after that first gathering between Native Americans and the immigrants from uh, Europe, they didn't just say, hey, this is a good idea. Let's do it again. <laughs> it was a much more complicated story than that, Tony. Absolutely. And I had no idea. So Denise, I, we were talking a little bit before this, and Denise and I have known each other for a few years, and I'm such a fan of her work and her as a human being. So thank you for uh, asking me to, to help today. Um, oh, thank you. But I mean, the story of Thanksgiving is such a complicated one and it's one that a lot of people are afraid to delve into. And I was very intrigued to know that there is a woman behind this day that I think most people have never heard of before. And so can you talk a bit about the, the, the main character in this book? Although the book doesn't really, I mean, it, 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 you cram so much history and yet it's not. It's not that long. I mean, you really put a compared lot. Compared to my other, I mean, that's, I mean, compared to my other books, I was talking to someone who's, who's, who's read my work, um, you know, prior, prior books. And they said, this one's small. And I was like, I like that. they said, but there's a lot in it. And I said, mm -hmm. yes, yeah. So it, it's, it's uh, compact, but it does uh, pack a bit of a yes. historical punch I'd like yeah. to think but um yeah it's you know and and you said you know the woman who who's at the yeah. at the heart of the story and she is she's a she's a good chunk of the of the middle of this of this book but the book itself we gather together you know takes us in my opinion, on uh, a, it's sort of a look at American history through the lens of gratitude. So mm -hmm. for me, gratitude is is the main character in this story. But when we when we start to look at how what we all consider to be, you know, Thanksgiving, the Thanksgiving we know um, and experience annually uh, in present day in the United States, uh, this woman, Sarah Josepha Hale, is a, a big part of how that tradition um, took shape. And so she is a she is a big chunk of this story. Yeah. What was the uh, you write in the beginning about your own appreciation for the holiday and this this feeling of the importance of gratitude, but also I believe you're in Italy. Right. And you, you're trying to get the traditional Thanksgiving food. And it is that feeling of being grounded and the comforts of 
turkey and stuffing and all of that that we know and love. And I wondered what Thanksgiving means to you and why you decided to write this book. You know, it's interesting because the different elements of this book, uh, the concept of gratitude, the um, how Thanksgiving developed in an entirely different direction during the Civil War, which you and I, I'm sure, are, are going to get into, um, and uh, just sort of the overall global concept and and history of of gratitude and giving thanks um, as an idea which has existed as long as humans have walked the earth all those things sort of started to to come together but you know one of the things that was a real impetus for me looking back and as writers I think you know we get these ideas and we take notes and you know I think I want to write about this but that's not enough I like this other element but that's not enough and then sometimes things just sort of start to gel and for me one of the formative moments that made me want to write about how we kind of codify our behaviors around giving thanks was my experience living abroad. So I've, I've lived in, in France and I've lived in Italy. I lived in Italy longer. And I have these memories of, um, you know, Thanksgiving in Italy and just trying to find cranberries for, cran yes. for cranberries. Yes, <laughs> cranberry sauce. And back when I lived in Italy, it was very difficult. And uh, we're running around and talking to, you know, who had a family member or who worked for the UN, who had a commissary and, you know, might be able to get us cranberries. And we're running around and I'm thinking, why, why do I, why do I care so much about this? And then on a separate occasion, um, celebrating Thanksgiving with a friend in Paris and managing to track down, um, good turkeys uh, at this particular butcher who catered to uh, the expat community. We thought we had found just the tiniest turkey in the world <laughs> and um, it would not fit into my friend's little Parisian oven. And so we end up trying to cook this turkey for Thanksgiving with the oven like cracked open a little <laughs> bit, which if turkeys take long enough. And, you know, with the, with the oven cracked open, it's a whole other other, other experience that makes you concerned about, you know, food poisoning and various other, uh, other things. And to me, it's very interesting how um, sort of when you're outside of your, outside of your cultural community, um, and in that case, a very large cultural community, uh, the United States, how those traditions and things kind of take a you really realize how deep those roots go to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember thinking, you know, why is this, uh, you know, why is this so important to me? And then I also, you know, have known most of my, you know, adult life that the story I was told growing up about uh, the first Thanksgiving was not accurate and uh, also not entirely, <laughs> not respectful and, and, uh, hurtful to the indigenous peoples of, of the United States and North America prior to the existence of the United States. So I thought, you know, I, I, I want to get down to how, how did this, how did this holiday get here? Mm -hmm. And why do we, you know, why do we still practice it? And what can it mean? And when I really started to think about just the idea of gratitude and giving mm -hmm. thanks, which is something that cultures have done all over this planet forever. Um, mm -hmm. There was a real simplicity and beauty to that, that uh, I wanted to look further into. And then I also wanted to look at just sort of how the practice of that had evolved um, here in the United States. Uh, I know because I also had a pandemic book come out um and fun. Uh, so, so fun it's yeah. really great yes I don't want to complain but it's not the easiest thing in the world right so um I wondered when you started this book how long it took you and then how it evolved because you're writing about gratitude at a time when a lot of people in this country 
you know, especially when the book came out last year, the feeling of real um, vulnerability and sadness and loss. And so the book came out at a really interesting time, I think, because we're all trying to be appreciative for the things that we have. And if you are healthy or grateful, or if you haven't lost someone you love in the pandemic, you're grateful. But for those people who have, it's, it's, it's also, you know, it's, it's just a tricky thing to be talking about gratitude, but it's such an important thing. Yep. When we're going through a time when we all need to be reminded of it. So I guess my question is, how long did it take you to write the book? And then when it came out during the pandemic, really at the height of it, were you surprised at people's reactions in that they were were happy to talk about gratitude? Or do you think that people really recoil from the idea because there's so much not to be happy about (laughs) right now? It's so funny because such you know, so much of what you're talking about also speaks to the process that writers go through when they're conceiving, executing, and promoting a book, right? So books have these weird, long lives. And in the case of We Gather Together, um, I had been interested in the idea of how Thanksgiving kind of came to be evolved uh, the inaccuracies the you know different paths that thanksgiving took in the united states i was fascinated um by the concept of gratitude and the recent research say the last you know 10 20 years that has been done in the power and importance of having a gratitude practice and the effects that that can have on your Uh, physical, mental, and emotional health. Um, So when I started thinking about how to bring these ideas together, the pandemic didn't exist. And, you know, so I'm I'm writing this book, I'm looking into uh, the Civil War, I'm looking into early origins of uh, harvest festivals, and uh, the origins of like the word of Thanksgiving and all these sorts of things and and 21st century uh, research into uh, gratitude practices and, you know, trying to bring all these things together into the the book that turned out to be We Gather Together. And, um, and I'm writing about also, you know, how uh, different Thanksgivings over time, including Thanksgiving, for example, during uh, the Spanish flu. So I'm writing about all of this and, you know, just writing about it the way you do. And you get in your little cave and and you do your research and you do your writing. And then as writers, the book, the world in which we conceive a book is always different than the world in which we complete a book, which is then different uh, (laughs) compared to the world in which that book lands. So by the time I write the book, turn it in, we're editing the book and it's a totally different world now. And so I am editing a book we have titled, we gather together as the phrase, social distancing is starting to to take off. And um, going back and editing the sections about the Spanish flu suddenly, you know, before it was just like, oh, Thanksgiving during the Spanish flu. Yeah. When I was editing and we were in the midst of the pandemic, it was like, wow, okay, this feels different now. This is landing a little differently now. Um, And, you know, uh, to me, the linchpin, why I wanted to do this book was this idea, this, this, this core concept of, of gratitude, the importance of finding a way to be thankful in the midst often of just moments where it seems like there is nothing you can, you you know, you can be thankful for and how important that is. And they've done, you know, there's so much neuroscientific research now about how powerful that can be, not just being able to find things to be thankful for, but being able to find those things in the midst of difficulty. So that aspect of the book that I thought was, oh, this will be a nice thing to have at the end of the book suddenly became really important because being able to find uh, that, you know, find that 
that power within yourself to say, I know things are really horrible right now. Terrible things are happening. Uh, people are losing family members. We're losing that ability to, to gather together all of those sorts of things. Being able to find um, a reason to say thank you in the midst of all of this. Um, there, there is research that says that's, that's very important and that, that means something. So for me as a writer, this tail end of the book that I thought was just a nice way to wrap things up to me sort of became the most, pretty much one of the most important aspects of the book. And, um, one of the most, uh, I think the thing that sort of has kind of the longest mm -hmm. tail in a sense. Um, and it's just one of those, it's one of those situations where you realize, you know, you're, it's, they say you can't step into the same, you know, river twice. You can't mm -hmm. kind of pick up the same book twice in a way. I mean, the, the moment in which you read a book or research a book is so um, influenced by the circumstances in which you've written it, researched it, read it, shared it, talked about it. Um, and I've never had uh, a book in a sense kind of um, kind of change and evolve yeah. as much as this one has, you know, because of the because of the pandemic. I mean, in a way, the timing is is good too. It's because you're you're reminding people. Yeah, releasing a book during the pandemic is <laughs> fantastic. The timing is awesome. <laughs> Not being able to go to the right store. Right. <laughs> but you're saying we gather together. So the book is about <clears throat> families. You know, we were all in our little bunkers, you know, when your book came out. And it was pre-vaccine. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you were ha having Thanksgiving with your, you'd be having it if you were, you know, uh, uh, paying attention to the rules with a small close knit group of people and, um, and still being a little bit, you know, concerned. And so I read the book thinking, um, this reminds me why it's important, you know, and this, it, and this woman's kind of long struggle. And that's another thing that I thought about Sarah Josepha Hale is that, man, she had determination. Yeah, and so she, oh my gosh. I, just, I mean, I get frustrated after a couple of years on a project. She spent how long, like decades trying to get so, someone to pay attention? Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, you know, we gather together, I'm talking about ancient Rome, I'm talking about the 21st century, but the heart of the book in many ways is Sarah Josepha Hale, this 19th century woman who, you know, widowed mother of five with no formal education, mm -hmm who ends up becoming one of the most powerful, if not the most powerful uh, editor in the United States. Um, and she, you know, she, she was obsessed with, with writing. Uh, she was, did not get to go to school as, as we all know it, but she grew up in a, in a house with books, lots of books. Her parents encouraged her to read her older brother, you know, would bring home everything that he had learned at, you know, at Dartmouth and, and share it with her. Um, and, How you know, she, she married take it seriously. I want, I've always wanted to ask that because she was editing Harriet Beecher Stowe and Edgar Allan Poe, right. And all of these huge yeah. But how, how did she get to the point where she had this job where she was mentoring these, you know, hugely famous authors? Because I think yeah. of a, a mother, widowed mother of five in the 19th century as not having a lot of leeway to, to yeah. do something. It's, it's really, it's one of those, boy, you talk about bloom where you're planted. I mean, she just... You know, she had this. She had this passion for reading and learning. She was fortunate to marry a man, David Hale, who just res respected everything about who she was and and how she was in the world. And they, she would. She wrote it at the end of uh, one of the doing research. One of the best parts of. Uh, finding out about Sarah Josepha Hale was looking at what she wrote about herself um, as uh, she would do these little, you know, mini biographies in the back of anthologies she would edit or things of that nature. And she would talk about her life. 
And she and her husband would have study hour together. So here's a woman whose education basically came from books and from her older brothers. And she married a man, they, they had study hour, you know, the eight to 10 at night in, in the living room, you know, one night it might be, we're going to read and talk about botany. Another night it would be, we're going to read and talk about French. Um, and she also was always writing and she would write about her experiences. Um, and her, 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 uh, her knowledge of reading, she was able in her, in her small town in New Hampshire to be able to get a job uh, teaching at a schoolhouse and she would write about what she saw there. One of the, one of the things that she wrote about as a teacher was, uh, one of her students and this, uh, she wrote a poem about this, uh, student's experience with, with a small animal. This, this poem we know as Mary had a little lamb. Uh, it was called Mary's lamb. So that's Sarah Josepha Hale. Uh, was she getting royalties from that? <laughs> <laughs> if only. So, um, Man. you know, and it's funny when we were, um, editing the book, we thought, well, do we put the whole, the, the thing that shocked me the most was this is a long poem. I mean, I just know like two verses. Yeah. It's really long. And the whole thing is really about kindness. And we actually put the whole thing in the book. Um, just because I thought it was so, we all thought it was so interesting and, and said so much about who she was, but anyway, so, so her husband encouraged her reading and her study and they encouraged each other and they, um, you know, they talked, they wrote, she wrote a lot. He was always telling her, you know, you should actually try and publish some of the things that you write. And he died suddenly, uh, from pneumonia as a lot of people did back then, it was unexpected. He died uh, just weeks before their uh, their their last child uh, was born, and there she was. And she was very clear about the fact that even though he was a lawyer, he was a country lawyer, so she wasn't sitting on a bunch of money that she could just you know kick back and go, "Hey, I'm going to try writing." She had to make a living. Um, she worked in a milliner's shop with her sister in law uh, for a little while. She kept writing, writing, and then uh, would send stories out, had a little bit of luck. Uh, one of her first bylines was a lady of New Hampshire, you know, would not even use her name at times. Um, and then she wrote a novel. She worked and wrote a novel called Northwood, um, it, which talked about life in the North and life in the South. And she was in New England. But it was one of the first books that really kind of talked about uh, slavery and the difference of life between um, life in the North and life in the South of the United States at the time. And this was, you know, more than 25 years before uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin. Mm -hmm. And the book got enough attention that it was published also in England. And she was approached to edit a new ladies magazine. And she did. She started editing a ladies magazine and then that magazine merged with a much larger magazine uh, edited, published by a man named Louis Godi. And that relationship uh, with Godi's Ladies Book or American Ladies Magazine, Godi's Ladies Magazine, the magazine had different names over the years. That was the magazine that had a, ma had a massive circulation and really just kind of put her in a position where she's writing her editor's letter and she's, uh, you know, weighing in on issues of the day. And, you know, the, the circulation of that magazine was so far beyond what the actual subscription rate was because you had this sort of parlor pass along element that would go on back then where, you know, you might have a subscription to a magazine, you'd read it, and then you'd pass it on to your neighbor, that person would read it, pass it on to their neighbor. And these just became these kind of almost like book sharing, like mini library, uh, you know, sharing things that would go on in communities. And so it was really, it, it, it just, it's interesting how she ended up just sort of, you know, at the head of, of this really, really influential women's magazine. Was she an abolitionist? I, I, I don't even, I don't know. An answer. abolitionist? No, yeah. she wasn't. She wasn't an abolitionist and she wasn't a suffragette. However, uh, she did write about 
she did write about slavery and she did write about women's rights to education. So she was interesting in that she and people looking back at her from the 21st century will say like, well, she, you know, could have or should have taken a stronger position um, on some of these topics. And she could have, but she it was interesting to see how she sort of chose to work her work her way through these topics through her writing and through the people that she decided to publish. So for example, um, when it came to the suffrage movement, she, you know, was not an active part of that at all. However, <laughs> she lobbied for women's rights to education, uh, women's rights to essays on how women should get to keep their property when they get married, like what were considered to be extremely forward thinking ideas at the time, but she just didn't align herself with a particular movement. So it was, it was kind of interesting to look at how she decided to uh, kind of maneuver that aspect of uh, what was going on culturally and politically. I mean, maybe that was the smart political move for her too, right? That she thought she needed to be moderate on some of these issues to stay in her position at this magazine. I well, mean, that's, I, I mean, that's, that could be, I mean, you know, as a researcher, when you're doing nonfiction, you always want to find like that letter or that essay where it says, I did this because I thought blank. Um, if you look at what she, if you look at some of the stuff that she wrote, and I quote a lot of her, um, I quote a lot of her, of her essays and editorials and thoughts, especially on women's education in the book. Um, and, and women's rights, uh, retaining their, their rights to money and property after they get married. She was very progressive when it came to those things. And there were also at the, at the same time in history, there were women who were much more outspoken, uh, women like Lydia Marie Child, fascinating, fascinating woman who's also in the book. Um, there were women who lost their jobs and, mm -hmm. and lost their livelihood because of you know, speaking out, which is not to say, you know, Hale was right, mm -hmm. these other women are, were wrong, but um, when people say, why wasn't she, you know, more active in the suffrage movement, I can't say she wasn't because of X, Y, or Z, because unless she says it, I'm not going to say it as mm -hmm. a nonfiction writer, but it, you know, you can imagine that she was interested in putting her ideas Forth, but not necessarily within the uh, within the uh, I guess within the structure of an actual uh, movement. So she just yeah. sort of had her own way of you know sharing what she thought was right and what she thought mattered to her. And I think the movements the movements going on around her weren't necessarily what you know, occupied her mind. She could have had completely other reasons for not yeah. being involved, but. If, I mean, you don't have to be an know. activist to be supportive of something either. It sounds yeah. like she was, yeah. Um, do, but what I, one of the things I really like about her, aside from just this kind of dogged, kind of like never giving up, she was going to get. Yeah, so we have I mean, we actually haven't, I feel we, we actually haven't, said out loud since we've started talking that she was this woman who kept petitioning yes. people, presidents to say Thanksgiving should be one day a year and we should all celebrate it on the same day together every year at the same time. What made her think that so that President Lincoln should take the time during the Civil War to listen to her though? I mean, it's just that it, she had so much confidence and didn't she, did she go to the White House and meet with him? Can you talk about how she tried to lobby him and others or what, what went into that? So she, so she came out of her father, uh, her father had fought in the Revolutionary War, was injured during the Revolutionary War. She was very attached to the idea of the United States of America. 
uh, during her lifetime in the early and mid uh, 1800s, it was very clear that the union that her father had fought and been injured for was really starting to fray and, and pull apart. Uh, so I think that was kind of part of her development as, um, as a human. Mm -hmm. She had a uh, very strong sort of cultural affinity for uh, harvest festivals, Thanksgivings, the New England concept of Thanksgiving, uh, you know, the, the dinners that went along with it, the celebrations that went along with it, uh, the families coming together. Um, and, you know, back, back then, I mean, you know, Thanksgiving in Connecticut might be on one day and New Hampshire on another, this state might not practice it at all. This other place might have it more than once a year. And it, she thought, wouldn't it be a wonderful unifying experience mm -hmm if the entire United States of America had Thanksgiving on the same day every year, the president should proclaim that because Thanksgivings were, and theoretically still are proclaimed um, by the president. The president issues a proclamation every year, even to, to, through the present day. Um, and so she starts, she's writing about this as the ed editor or editress, as she called herself, the editress. Mm -hmm. I like that. Yeah, I am the editress um, of the ladies book. Um, and she would write about uh, how important it would be, how wonderful it would be, how unifying it would be. Uh, and she in Northwood, for example, in her novel, I mean, she has practically the, the characters, uh, there's an event that takes place and they are all together for, for a Thanksgiving meal. There's this giant, it's, it's practically a whole chapter about you know, how to set the table, where the kids should sit, all the different pickles and what you should eat and the butters and the, I mean, it is, it, she was Martha Stewart before Martha Stewart was around. She was the, you know, and she had this massive audience. She was, if she lived today, she would be this incredible influencer, right? I mean, she was telling people how they should cook and how they should eat and how they should entertain. Um, and so she started writing ambassadors and governors uh, and eventually presidents that, you know, let's please do this. And, and she wanted it to be a presidential decree. And she petitions, you know, Taylor and Fillmore and Pierce and Buchanan, and she doesn't get any traction. But every year she keeps getting more heads of territories and more governors kind of on her bandwagon that, yeah, we're going to do it this last Thursday of November. We're going to do it this last Thursday of November, which is what she kept arguing mm. for. And then in 1863, she approaches uh, William Seward and Abraham Lincoln, and Lincoln gets on board and issues mm. a proclamation for the entire United States of America that 1863 Thanksgiving, you know, was in the midst of just one of the, the Thanksgiving, the coming together and during one of the most divisive times ever in the history of this country. Um, and there it was. And that was the beginning of the annual uh, Thanksgiving that we have come to know today. And, you know, she kept petitioning people after Lincoln because she said, you know, what we really need is it needs to be a congressionally established holiday. And she knew it would always be changeable and at the whim of the president and governors, et cetera, if it wasn't a congressionally uh, established holiday, a, a true federal holiday. And that actually didn't happen till World War II. You know? So she actually, she actually didn't live to see uh, Thanksgiving become the federal holiday that she imagined, but she did see the beginnings of that annual tradition um, start to start to take root. And it's I mean, no small coincidence that both of these big moments happened during incredibly difficult moments in history. And, and that's so, I mean, to me, that was one of the things that I didn't, I, I found her fascinating because also, I mean, she's the editor, she's this incredible personal story. Cause you know, like I said, no formal education, she becomes this very powerful 
uh, editor of women's magazines. She's obsessed with Thanksgiving being a national holiday and she's petitioning presidents and actually gets that established. But she also spent so much time um, just promoting other people's work, mm -hmm. uh, raising money for, uh, for, you know, the families of people who did not return, from, who had, she had a brother who was lost at sea. She was big and, you know, she raised money for um, the families of folks who had lost people at sea of, uh, you know, veterans. Um, she was constantly, you know, this whole sort of give small thing that, you know, we talk about today, almost sort of like, um, you know, uh, these fundraisers you see that are like, you know, give five bucks, give 10 yeah. bucks. Well, back then she and her magazine was saying, give 25 cents. And she would raise <laughs> thousands of dollars for people who, who needed it. Um, so in the midst of all this stuff she was doing, she was constantly trying to bring attention to other people and what they, what they needed. Um, and you know, that she was able to, um, you know, finally get Lincoln to agree to this in the middle of the Civil War, mm. um, to me was very moving. But I, you know, again, I didn't want to just write a book about her and I didn't just want to write a book about the Civil War. But when I saw that, like two of the most significant moments in the mm -hmm. history of giving thanks took place during the Civil War and during World War II, um, that to me is very inspirational because again, and then the gratitude piece to me for was the linchpin. So in all of this, it's that idea that, yeah, things are going really horribly right now, but we're going to stop and say, thank you for whatever. So if you could be, I want to make sure I ask you this question. If you could be a, a speech writer right now, if you were a president Biden's speech, right? One of the speech writers, and you were going to do the national, the proclamation for Thanksgiving, oh. which is usually just like a paper statement that they issue. And it's very pro forma, not anything too fascinating. I remember as a white house reporter, we would just like skim it over because they're right. Like, um what would you what would you have them say I mean we're we're coming out the other side of hopefully <clears throat> of the pandemic and um I know that you've talked about about how important Thanksgiving should be this year and so um well I mean what would you have them say that isn't uh not offensive but I mean I guess there is something that psychologically gets me about the specific time we're going through where people are reticent about being thankful because people are unhappy they you know people are always unhappy to an extent but there's inflation and people are quitting their jobs and people are you know suffering and so wh what would you have him say what, what are the most important themes in a proclamation this year well, you know, Biden's always asking me my opinions. So I know. Well, now's your chance. <laughs> no, I mean, it's, I mean, that's what's, what's so interesting to me is I think most people don't uh, realize, I didn't realize the, I, I thought, I didn't realize that every single year there's a presidential proclamation of Thanksgiving every year. Mm -hmm. And those proclamations used to be quite, especially in the beginning when, the last Thursday of November, not the fourth Thursday of November as we have now, but the last Thursday of November wasn't set in congressional stone. So the president saying this is going to be the national Thanksgiving and then governors and heads of other of territories, et cetera, would follow suit. And this would be in the newspaper and and what they printed and the proclamations are fascinating. And I, I talk about a lot of them over time in the book. But um, these are all things you can look up and dig into on your own. If you're an educator or just a curious, you know, individual, you can you can find all the texts of all the presidential proclamations. And they used to get a lot more press. And, you know, some presidents use them to, you know, what they were thankful for was, you know, 
something they had accomplished. It was sort of like they were using the proclamation to say like, hey, isn't it great that this thing happened? Oh, that. Um, and then other times it was, you know, where, you know, Wilson's proclamation during, you know, World War I was very interesting. Um, and just prior to World War I. And you can look at how the proclamations kind of evolved depending on what the country is experiencing. And I, for one, almost more than what could or should um, Biden say in his first ever, I mean, it's kind of, it's his first ever Thanksgiving proclamation. I kind of want to just take the Thanksgiving proclamation back and have the office you know, really celebrate it more and really push it forward more. I mean, it is an, it is an opportunity to say what you think is important for everyone to embrace and not necessarily a policy you want to put forward. I mean, presidents have done that, certainly. Um, during the proclamations, but it's it's if done if done well, um, you know, it could be an opportunity to really zero in on what are those things for which we can all be thankful, all of us, and that that's the challenge that I would like to see President Biden rise to because there are things that no matter how divided this country is right now, and it is, there are so many things that we can all come together around and say thank you for. And if he can zero in on those and not just that, but actually sort of give the Thanksgiving proclamation um, sort of new life, kind of mm -hmm. take it back, put it back out there again on a larger scale in a sense. Um, you know, the, 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 the turkey pardoning and all that stuff gets more attention now. I mean, you know, I mean, the, you know, make the proclamation a big deal again and really use it to really use it to unify. Um, mm -hmm. That's what I mean. That's what I would, I would love to see that. Well, I would love to see him kind of thread that needle because I don't know what you could get everybody to agree on because if you say the vaccine, you're going to have a lot of people saying that's not true, right? So, I mean, there's just, there, there is almost no issue that I can think of that you could get a universal group of, you know, people, you can't have the environment, you can't, I mean, what, what could it possibly be? I think that's the, the problem. Love of our, the love of our families and friends. I mean, I don't know, you've got, kind of got to go very, I feel as though you've sort of got to go because even love of true, even support for our troops is now a hairy issue after Afghanistan, right? So after the troop withdrawal. So it, it's like that was, that used to be the go-to thing that every president could say, we support our troops, God bless our troops. And he still does it. But I'm, there's so many people who are furious at how that drawdown happens. So I almost think that politically uh, it's, it's almost impossible. So I don't say that. Now you're making me sad. <laughs> oh, health and health and health and welfare. I mean, you know, get get very. I think he has. I think I would like to see him get very aspirational, mm -hmm. very aspirational, as opposed to issue focused. Just very aspirational. Those sorts of things that anyone who lives and breathes uh, and is just trying to kind of make it through this life. Mm -hmm can can get on board with it's yeah. tricky but you know then again that's you know why i'm not if he wants help i'm here but oh, right and that's his job he's, he's just giving me a ring but um you know it's I, I would i would really love i would really love to see that just kind yeah. of really go in a very aspirational welcoming unifying yeah um direction yeah well i i hope that i hope that he's uh that, that one day you do get to give your input on that because you are the expert on Thanksgiving and and gratitude and honestly, I think that I think that we need it now more than ever. So we I, do, and that was one of the more interesting aspects for me of this book was seeing that um, 
you know, it's not just, yes, it's important to be thankful and it's important to appreciate, but there is hard scientific research that has been done that shows that it is so incredibly important to your well being as an individual to be able to take a moment and find things in life, no matter what's going on around you, to say thank you for it. Yeah. Well, you're inspiring me to do a gratitude journal. There you go. That's it, could be as simple as that. That's right. Yeah, simple as that. I want to remind, and I'm going to jump in now. I want to remind our viewers they can put questions in the uh, the question and answer box. And I just want to follow up on on Kate's question, Denise. Do you think people feel grateful now for much of anything? I think people. I mean, I can speak to my personal experience with other individuals, and I, which is what I kind of try to focus on because I know if I get sucked into what I see on the news or what I see on social media, it is very easy for me to feel as though no one's thankful for anything and everybody's just, you know, very angry and upset. But these little moments, what I would like to call like just small moments of grace that you can find in everyday life, um, you know, somebody, you know, the, the checkout person at the grocery store is saying, gosh, I'm so, you know, it's such a beautiful day. I just, I, I'm having a great day. Are you having a great day? And you're like, that's wonderful. You know, the, all these little tiny moments where you can see people being thankful. I, my little, my neighbor's kids up the street are so happy to be in school. My gosh, they're so happy to be in school with their classmates. And they came over and they're just so happy to be able to hang out with their friends at school again. And that is a level of gratitude that I think is having a tremendous impact on their young lives. Um, you know, all these, it, it's, it's looking for that. It's almost the, the energy that goes into looking for those looking to recognize that gratitude that uh, in and of itself has a certain level of influence and power, I think. So I do, I, I do think there are, I do think people are thankful for, th for things. And I think it's hard for us to see that sometimes because we're so bombarded by everything that's not great um, well that's, that's what i wanted to get at because you know the one difference between what has happened in years past is right now you have social media that seems to push division um the things that used to bring people together i i think back uh, years ago, the uh, when I was growing up, the polio vaccine, when that came out, I remember my mom saying, you know, now we, we don't have to be afraid for our kids. Now there's a vaccine out and it's, it divides rather than brings together. It is like finding those things that bring us together is harder now than maybe it it's was. I, it's, I think the seeking and the looking is part of the power of that moment though. I mean, that, that to me, it's turning away from the, the social media and just sort of looking around in your everyday life and seeking as an individual to recognize those moments that might be inspirational. I'll tell you a story from my farmer's market. So we had a horrible uh, storm pass through here over the summer. I think it was, I want to say it was Fred. And it wasn't a hurricane when it came through Western North Carolina, but it dumped a lot of rain. And it, um, it destroyed a couple of small farms here in my area. And that, that's horrible, right? That sounds terrible. It, and it was, it was horrible for a lot of people. So we're at the farmer's market the weekend after, and going to our usual farmers 
and uh, to go buy, you know, we, we go to the same people all the time. And the, you, the guys we usually went to said, don't buy from us this week, go buy from, from, you know, this farm over here, the ones that had suffered the most. And I thought, that's beautiful. You know, that's, these are, these are all farmers trying to make a small farmers trying to make a living off of what they grow. And they are turning away sales to go help out people who had a really tough time. And that was like, that was one of my best weekends this year. And I thought in the midst of everything that's going on, you have people turning away dollars to go help somebody else. And it's just like finding those moments in your life and saying, that's nice. People do that for, for each other. And those people are out there. And some, sometimes it's just kind of shifting your lens a little bit and sort of, you know, opening your eyes to those just, again, those just little moments of grace that happen all the time. Um, it, 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 but it's hard. I mean, it's, it's a, it's, it's finding a way to pay a different kind of attention, but I felt great after that. And it came out of tragedy, it came out of, you know, rains and storms and floods and people losing their property. But it, that it was a really wonderful feeling to witness that going on, you know, and it came out of a very difficult time, but it's training and in the, with all this, with all this social media noise and everything going on, it's like, almost like we all have to retrain our attention retrain mm -hmm. how we look at the world, retrain how we remain aware of what's going on around us. Do we need a, a new Sarah Hale? Oh my gosh, right? I mean, well, I mean, can't we all find a little bit of Sarah Hale within us? You know, I mean, here was a woman who, you know, in her day, she didn't, I mean, she's, most people still don't know who she is. I mean, this was not, what's interesting is I was, I was talking earlier when Kate and I were talking, was talking about how if she were around today, you know, she, this is a woman who basically said women should wear white wedding dresses, wrote Mary had a little lamb, uh, popularized Christmas trees. Uh, you know, I mean, this was a person who was a, a, a cre basically created, you know, Thanksgiving that with the what the Thanksgiving we know this was a person who had a massive effect on culture I mean today she would be she'd have you know two million Instagram followers and she'd be you know she popularized the word lingerie I mean you know all this sort of stuff but the thing is she wasn't using her influence to make money and you know get ad revenue she often was using her influence to shift attention to people who needed things, to people to, to raise money for others, to popularize the works of uh, up and coming writers. She wrote and she edited anthologies of, you know, people she considered to be influential women writers. No one was talking about anthologies of influential women writers that they, they didn't care back then, you know? So she wasn't just doing all of this to promote herself she was doing it to bring attention to things she thought were important. And that, I mean, we could all be a little, little Sarah Hale, I think, you know, take the, take, you know, whatever, whatever you can do to, to shine a little light on somebody who needs it, you know, why not? Sure. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Tony. We, yes. We do need another, we need many Sarah Hales. We need many. Sort of, Hales. Sort of the, the pebble in the, uh, in the pond that the sends the ripples out ripples. and builds up a wave. That's right. Send out those ripples. Yeah. One thing and, I never asked you, Denise, was about, oh, sorry, Tony. I just, I, I never got yeah. to ask about the myth busting that you do in this book and the idea that, you know, indigenous people were not necessarily, you know, thrilled to have their land taken. And, yeah, and it wasn't, yeah, but, but, yeah, we don't, well, um, yeah, that's a whole other discussion, I guess. But do you consider, um, do you think that we've come far enough in 
our understanding of Thanksgiving and how it's taught in most schools to understand that this was indeed kind of a, a falsehood that we were taught a myth that it was much more complicated than that and oh, much more interesting no I don't think we've I don't I don't think we've come far enough and in fact I mean I originally was going to write this entire my whole idea was there you know what we grew up learning about Thanksgiving was a myth and a hurtful myth and exploitive of uh, indigenous peoples and kind of, you know, looking past all of the horrific injustices that were done to the original occupants of this country. But the reason that myth, so I'm not, I'm not, but what's interesting to me and another reason I wanted to write this is I'm not busting any myths that haven't been busted for decades, but the myths persist, I think, because we're not putting in any other stories. And, you know, one of the things I think was interesting is there are so many interesting stories related to uh, gratitude, uh, the evolution of Thanksgiving uh, celebrations over time, um, prior to the existence of the United States, during the existence of the United States into the 21st century. So it's sort of like I wanted to put new stories in place because I think sometimes these myths persist because uh, people keep telling them to kids and then we don't correct it later on, right? You don't, you, you know, you tell kids something in second grade, it's not like you take them aside during AP history in high school and go, by the way, that was all wrong. Um, they just kind of forget about it. So I, I, I wanted to show that there was a way to talk about, just kind of get back to the roots of what um, a Thanksgiving practice is or could be, Thanksgiving has evolved over time. It can evolve again. We can just go back to it being about, keep your turkey, it's wonderful. I love turkey. I love cranberry sauce. I have great recipes. Keep keep the gratitude aspect, but let's, let's get rid of, um, you know, the hurtful mythologies. And there, there are wonderful stories to be had, inspirational stories, and at least accurate stories. Uh, to be had about how um, this holiday has, you know, evolved over time. And, you know, we can all continue to evolve. I mean, ideally, as as humans and as a culture, yeah, you know, evolution is, you know, always, always, I'm always. Just reminded, I'm just reminded of a story and it's, it's um, apocryphal, but it's John Henry Falk had one uh, that NPR used to run every Christmas and it was about Christmas day. And it was a whole story about gratitude and people who had little sharing that with other people who had very little. Um, there is always something to, uh, to be grateful for if we just take the time and, and look around. It's the sort of thing Denise has brought out, you should get a copy of We Gather Together, um, especially from the standpoint, it makes you think, it, it makes you open your eyes to the things that are around you and, and the things that uh, we should all be, be grateful for. I am grateful to, to have both of you here tonight. Uh, Denise, Kate, thank you very much. Acapella Books has copies of the book for sale with a book plate signed by Denise, uh, you can get those there. So thank you both for being here tonight and thank you for watching. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you.